This is section 13.5, the last section for Math 206. Woo! Exciting time. It's a big one, too. It's a very big section. A lot of stuff happening in here. So, get to it. Take a look inside. Whew. All right, get ready. Buckle up, buck up. 36 slides here for this one. Volume, mass, temperature. All right, so here's the stuff that you're going to know by the time we finish this. I'm optimistic about this. Surface area versus volume. A lot of people get them confused. Okay, They both deal with three-dimensional figures. The surface area is all about covering an object. Volume is about how much space the object takes up. Now, if you're talking about like liquid volume, then we're talking about how much will fill an object. So that's really the difference between them is, is um, covering versus, you know, how much space the object takes up or filling it. So for volume, we use cubic units. We know for area and surface area, we used square units. We talked about squares covering a surface. Right, like tiling your kitchen floor with squares. That's an area. Volume is all about cubes and building that, that shape that you need. So the volume of each one of these figures is nine cubic units, right? Because there's nine cubes that make up both of these figures. But the surface areas are different. See, notice the blue cube gets slid over. When we do that, we expose two of the square sides that were not visible in the original. Okay. So what's the surface area? Well, the one on the left has 34 squares visible that you could paint. You could think about it that way. Whereas the one on the right has 36. So even though the volume can be the same, the surface area can be different. Okay, so just because two objects have the same volume does not mean they have the same surface area and vice versa. English measures of volume. So we have dry volume here. So cubic inch, cubic foot, cubic yard. Um, you've probably, where would you have heard of cubic feet? If you buy mulch, it usually comes in like cubic feet. It tells you how many you know, cubic feet of mulch is in there. Um, so it's maybe where you've seen that before. Let's talk about converting here. Remember when we did area, how we used the length conversion, and then we squared it to make it an area conversion. Now, well, same thing here. We're going to take the length conversion of three feet to one yard, but we're going to cube it to make it a volume conversion. So we're gonna take that 45 cubic yards, multiply it by three feet over one yard, and cube every one of those things inside your conversion factor. So right here's your conversion factor. We're going to cube all of that. That means the three gets cubed, turns into 27. The feet get cubed, the one gets cubed, stays one, and the yards get cubed. So that gives me this. Now, this linear conversion factor of one yard is three feet now turns into a volume conversion. So multiply 45 times 27, divide by 1, and we get 1215. This is very similar to what we did with area. We just have to cube it now. So pause the video and see if you can do this one. Remember that there are um, 12 inches in a foot, 3 feet in a yard, so that means there's 36 inches in a yard. So if you want to go ahead and use that straight conversion, you absolutely can. So multiplying by one yard, 36 inches. Remember that we have to keep our units lined up to where, like in this case, the inches cancel and we're left with yards, cubic yards in this case. And we cube everything, the one, the yards, 36, the inches. So this becomes 4320 over 36 cubed. All right, how about three cubic feet is how many cubic yards? Well, one yard's three feet. 
So if we use that conversion, that linear conversion, and we cube everything inside the conversion, don't cube this three out here. This three didn't do anything to be cubed. He already has cubic units attached to him. I'm just cubing what's inside this conversion factor. So then we get three times one divided by 27, three over 27, which is about 0.1. All right, so let's talk about converting metric units of volume. If we have one cubic decimeter, that means we have a cube that measures a decimeter by a decimeter by a decimeter. What's a decimeter? It's 10 centimeters or about a hand span. So if we convert that to centimeters, that cube becomes 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters. So the volume of that cube is a thousand cubic centimeters. So remember back in 13.2 when we converted those metric units of area, we used the stair steps, remember that, and we doubled the number of place values that we moved to convert metric units of volume, we're going to triple the number of place values because now we're cubing things, right? If you cube 10, you get a thousand. So now we're talking tripling the number of place values. All right, so I put the little stair steps up there for us. So we're gonna start with the number five. To get from meters to centimeters, we have to go to the right one, two places, triple that, so two times three is six places. So moving the decimal point on five, six places to the right, we end up with five million cubic centimeters. So these numbers get out of hand really quick okay? because we're talking about, you know, moving a decimal point, you know, a few places and then bam, tripling it. So, you know, we get a lot, a lot of decimal movement here. How about 12,300 cubic millimeters? Well, to go from millimeters to centimeters, you just move to the left one decimal place. Then if you triple that, one times three is three. So we gotta move to the left three places. So starting here at the end, and going to the left, one, two, three, puts the decimal point between the 12 and the three. So we get 12.3 centimeters cubed or cubic centimeters. Um, cubic centimeters is um, also abbreviated by CC. So if you've heard that term um, in the medical world, you know. 12 cc's of something, that's cubic centimeters. So volume versus capacity. The volume is the amount of space an object takes up. The capacity is the amount of liquid that's needed to fill an object. We typically use cubic units to measure the volume. And then for capacity, because it's liquid measure, we use things like um, milliliters, gallons, quarts, pints, cups, ounces, you know, things like that. So let's talk about some capacity for the for um, metric conversions. One centimeter cubed is also abbreviated one cc. One milliliter is the equivalent of one cc. A thousand milliliters is one liter. So remember, milli uh, that prefix is one one thousandth. So a thousand milliliters is equivalent to one liter. All right, so let's keep that in mind. We're going to need that. When we talk about the metric units, as always, we have our familiar prefixes. Kilo, hecto, deca, um, the base unit, deci, centi, milli. In this case, our base unit is liter. Remember, for length and area, it was meter. Now our base unit is a liter. Now, these are not cubic units, so we do not triple the number of place values that we move. When we do this with the cubic units, like cubic millimeters and cubic centimeters, that's where we have to triple. Here, this is just liters to milliliters. So we're just going to use the stair steps, okay? Liter to milliliter moves three places to the right. So here, let me go back. So liter, milliliter. Okay. So if we're going from liters to milliliters, 
we got to move one, two, three places to the right. I forgot to write the, uh, the stair steps out for us on this slide. So three places to the right makes us 27,000. Do not triple the number of place values. There's no cube. Okay. 362 milliliters. Now we're moving from milliliters to liters. So we're going to go left three units. So that puts us at 0.362. So it moves that decimal point from the end right here after the two back one, two, three places. Okay, so three milliliters. How many cubic centimeters is that? That's just three. That one seems too easy, but a milliliter is the same as a cubic centimeter. So that's our conversion between those dry and liquid units of measure. How about three cubic meters to liters? This one's a little more challenging because we're going to have to convert the cubic meters to cubic centimeters and then centimeters to milliliters and then milliliters to liters. Okay, that one's going to be 3,000. Why is that? Well, let me go back here. But look at that. We've got one liter is a thousand cubic centimeters. Okay, remember that one liter is a thousand cubic centimeters. So this would be three thousand cubic centimeters in here. So this three. Right. I'm mad at myself for not noticing this in the examples and actually drawing it out for you. So that three cubic meters, we move that to the cubic centimeters. We have to move to the right two places, which is really six places. OK, so we end up with three what million cubic centimeters. Which is three million milliliters, and then we got to bring that back three places to get it from the cubic um, from sorry the milliliters to the liters so we gotta bring it back three places so that one if that one throws you off um, and you want me to write up the details of that one just let me know because that one kind of snuck past me in the examples without me um, realizing it it's probably also that um, there's an easier conversion for that one I feel like I'm thinking yeah, I feel like there's an easier conversion than the ones that we had used. So, OK, um, I know this is blurry. This was the best one that I could find. I was pretty irritated. It was like <laughs> two or three in the morning and I was just so done with trying to make these slides because the original ones that came with the book were garbage. So anyway, the units of capacity and volume for the English system, we have the pint, the quart, the gallon, ounces, cups, things like that, right? And then we have the conversion between the English and the metric. So we have things like um, that one gallon is about 3.8 liters. So think about, you know, um, a gallon of milk versus like a three liter of pop, right? The gallon of milk slightly bigger than that three liter of pop. The, um, the next thing is called Cavallari's theorem. So this says that two solids, each with a base in the same plane, have equal volumes. Every plane parallel to the bases intersects a solid in cross sections of equal area. OK, this says that if you've got a stack of, say, quarters, and you take that stack and you kind of push them over a little bit, same volume, take up the same amount of space. Surface area is different, but same amount of space. So now if you kind of you know, move those quarters around and you make them kind of kind of all, you know, zigzaggy and stuff. Same volume. So that's what um, Cavallari's principle says. All right. Volume formulas. A right rectangular prism. In general, if you have a shape like a prism or a cylinder that is the same shape throughout. In general, the volume is just the area of the base times the height. Okay. So for this one, the area of the base is L times W, length times width, because it's a rectangle, times the height, H. 
Now, in the case of a cube, rather than give you a separate formula for cube, a cube is just a right rectangular prism with all the sides being squares. So the L, W, and H are all the same length. We just call it S for side length or E for edge length, whatever, right? So we get the volume is S cubed or E cubed, whichever one you want to say. A cylinder, because that's an extension of a prism, we have the area of the base times the height. Area of the base is a circle, pi r squared times the height, the height height, not the slant height, because this isn't slanted. So let's find the volume. For a cube, we have that it's just going to be six cubed. I don't know why those others are showing up over there. Those answers are showing up before the shapes do. Whatever. The volume of a cube is going to be six cubed. There's a learning curve here for me, so bear with me. Um, the right rectangular prism and the cylinder. So for the prism, we know it's just length times width times height. Right? So three times 10 times 15. For the cylinder, it's pi r squared times the height. So we get that 250 pi. So just kind of, you know, put three examples here on one page. The volume of a pyramid. So we notice we did the prisms and then the cylinders together because they were similar. You know, now the pyramids and the cones are gonna be similar. The volume of a pyramid is one third the area of the base times the height. Where's the one third come from? Not easy to see, but um, there's like some illustrations you can find that will take a pyramid and then the prism with the same base and same height and show you how you can take three of those kind of manipulated and fit those perfectly into that, that right prism. Um, for me, demonstrating it is, um, I would demonstrate it by using uh, these shapes that I have that have the little nets inside them. So we have a square prism that has the same size base as this um, prism, and it's got the same height. You can fill this prism up with something like, say, rice. I would not recommend water. It's too messy. But like rice, fill it up, dump it in here. Fill it up again, dump it in here. Fill it up again, dump it in here. It, then that would fill this one up perfectly. So this is a third of the volume of this. So the volume of this is length times width times height, right? Area of the base times the height. This is a third of that. So that kind of helps illustrate it. It doesn't really explain where the third comes from or why it's exactly a third, but it at least get kind of drive the point home. Cone's the same thing. It's a third of a cylinder. So a third of area of the base times the height. All right, so let's find the volume of a right square pyramid. I do want you guys to know how to use the formulas for volume. So the volume for this one is going to be 80 over 3. So where did this come from? The area of the base is 4 times 4, is 16. And then the height is 5. And then it's a third of that. So there's the 3, right? So the 4 times 4 is 16. 16 times 5 is 80. And then remember, the formula is one-third, the area of the base times the height. For a cone, same thing. One-third, area of the base times the height. Ooh, but this one is tougher. Because you're not given the height of the cone, you're given the slant height. So you have to first use the Pythagorean theorem to find h. So h squared plus 6 squared equals 10 squared. Okay, so we're going to use the Pythagorean theorem, find this h value, and then the volume is one-third pi 6 squared times that height. Okay, I'm going to leave that for you guys to, to work through that. To find that height using the Pythagorean theorem, and then the volume is going to be one third pi six squared times that number that you get. So the final answer is 96 pi. I'm going to leave that one for you guys to do. So make a note to yourself to go through, draw this picture on your paper and see if you can figure out how I got that number. Okay. 
find the volume of the pyramid represented by the net. This is a pyramid opened up. Okay, so that's a square pyramid that has been opened up. So here's the pyramid. And then if you open this up, that's what it's going to look like. So we want to find the volume of this. Okay, each triangle is an equilateral. Oh, that is so helpful. So here's what we get. The volume is one third the area of the base, which is just 10 times 10, times the height. Okay. Now I get that square root of 50, that slant height. Sorry, I said height, the slant height of this. Where did that square root of 50 come from? Well, if you use the Pythagorean theorem to find the slant height, you're going to have the base there of 10, right? So 10 squared equals L squared plus 5 squared. Now, this comes about because 10 is your hypotenuse because it's the same as the base of the pyramid. So if all the sides of the base are 10 and each of those triangles is equilateral, the sides of the triangle are all 10 as well. So L squared plus half of that 10 squared. So here, let me kind of point to it. L squared plus 5 squared equals 10 squared. Do you see that? L squared plus 5 squared equals 10 squared. I know that all of these sides are 10 because I was told that it was equilateral. These are all 10 because this is a square. So that's where the square root of 50 came from. So this is one of the examples that the uh, was on the original slide, and they gave you this, and I'm like, <laughs> they're not going to explain that square root of 50. Just going to leave that hanging out there. In the previous example, I could see leaving it, you know, for you to figure out the details and stuff. Okay, that's reasonable. This. Volume of a sphere. The volume of a sphere is four-thirds pi r squared. You're going to have to just trust me on this one, okay? Can't really derive this one. So find the volume of a sphere whose radius is six. Plug and chug. Easy peasy. Comparing measurements of similar figures. The ratio of any linear measurement of two similar figures, like the length, the width, the height, perimeter, diagonal, diameter, slant height, have the same scale factor, we'll say k. For similar triangles with scale factor k, the ratio of their areas is k squared, right? Because area is, you know, length times width, right? Or for similar polygons with scale factor k, the ratio of their areas is k squared. Okay? So for triangles, polygons, you guessed it, for volume, it's going to be k cubed if they're similar figures because we know that their sides are proportional. So if their sides are proportional, we get the same scale factor, just multiplied three times for volume, twice for area. So example eight, how does the surface area of a sphere that's 10 inches in diameter compare with the surface area of a sphere five inches in diameter? Now you may say, okay, well, the diameter is double, so the surface area is going to be double. Is it? No. Any two spheres are similar. The ratio of their diameters is 10 to 5. The whole colon, remember that from odds? So, or 2 to 1. The ratio of the surface areas is 2 squared to 1 squared, or 4 to 1. So even though the diameters doubled, if you think about the area, the surface area formula, R is squared. So yeah, one's double the other one, but when you square that double, you square that two, you get that the surface area then is four times the amount of the original. How does the volume compare? All right, well now we still have that double diameter. The volume formula for a sphere has R being cubed. So two cubed is eight. So the larger one is eight times the volume of the smaller one. Mass. Mass is the amount of matter that makes up an object. A weight is a force that's exerted by the gravitational pull of, in this case, Earth. 
the gram is the fundamental unit of mass in the metric system. Okay. Now, we often use mass and weight interchangeably. That's because at sea level, they're essentially the same. Okay. Um, but your weight actually varies. Like on the moon, where there's no gravitational pull, your weight, you're weightless, right? But your mass, the amount of stuff, space that you take up is the same. So depending on where you are and what that gravitational pull is, your weight changes. Now, fun fact, Earth's gravity actually exerts more force at lower sea levels. So like New Orleans is 10 feet below sea level in some places. Um, Denver, the mile high city, is about 5,280 feet above sea level. So you're gonna weigh slightly more in New Orleans than you would in Denver. So fun fact, lose some weight, move to Colorado. Um, the metric unit of gram is our base unit here for mass. And you can see that we've got the same usual suspects of kilo, hecto, deca, deci, centi, milli, but we have a new player in the game. Metric ton has entered the ring. Metric ton is a million grams. Frame of reference, because you probably have no idea how much a gram is. A gram is about the mass of a small paper clip. A kilogram is about the mass of two loaves of bread. Four kilograms is about, you know, you know, a newborn baby, about eight pounds, eight to nine pounds ish. So a kilogram is about 2.2 pounds. So if you ever go to the doctor and um, they weigh you and they have it in kilograms, like just to make you feel better about yourself. You know, I see that and I'm like, ugh, I got a math. <laughs> so I get that number multiplied by 2.2 to figure out how many pounds I am, figure out how fat their scale tells me I am. Um, fun fact, pound is abbreviated LBS because it is derived from the Latin word of Libra, meaning scales, you know, like the, um, Astrology sign, you know, for Libra. Also, the British unit of currency, is the pound, and it's like a cursive L, I think, with like a line or two through it. That's where it comes from. So, anyway, just trying to keep it interesting. Converting to the following. Notice that since these units are not cubed, we do not triple the number of place values. We only do that on the stair steps if we have these cubes on there. So this is just going from grams to kilograms. So going from grams to kilograms takes us to the left one, two, three places, just because I have it memorized, but I trust that you guys will look it up. That puts us at 0 0.034. Kilograms to tons. Ooh, that's an interesting one. Let's go back and look at that conversion. A thousand grams is a metric ton. Or sorry, a million, I mean, say a thousand. A million grams is a metric ton. That means a thousand kilograms is a metric ton. So a thousand kilograms is a ton. So that means how many thousands are in here? Well, moving that to the left three places, because of the we're dividing by a thousand we get 6.836 tons or metric tons. There is a difference between a ton and English ton and a metric ton. Um, I forget what that difference is. I know I should know that off the top of my head, but I don't. All right, so relationships are among metric units of volume, capacity, and mass. One cubic centimeter, remember was one milliliter, is the same as one gram of water. A cubic decimeter is about a liter is about a kilogram of water. Now we say water because there is a difference in the, the weight or the mass of say like milk or oil or something. So we do say that for water, one cubic centimeter is one milliliter is one gram. You use that conversion a lot in chemistry. So if you guys have to take any chemistry classes, you'll see that a lot. Okay, so almost done. This is slide 33. You can see that at the bottom right, we have 36 to go. Choose the most realistic measure, the mass of an iPhone. 
the length of an ant, the volume of a wine bottle, the area of an average home, the area of PAC, PSC's campus, the length of a city block, the volume of a washing machine. So I'm giving you three choices for each. So I want you to pause the video, okay, pause it, and then pick which one you think is the most realistic measure. Okay, there's only one answer here for each one of these. So pause the video, try to pick the most realistic measure for each one of these. Did you pause it? Did you? All right. The mass of an iPhone, 190 grams. Okay. Think about it. Four kilograms is about a newborn baby. You think 190 kilograms? That's a heavy phone. 190 milligrams? I mean, think of like an extra strength Tylenol is like what, 500 milligrams? The length of an ant. All right, two millimeters. Okay. True story. Last time I taught Math 206, I did this activity, and I swear to you, there was like four students who picked two kilometers for the length of an ant. This ant is going to destroy your home and everything that you love if it is two kilometers long. Okay, this is the ant to rule all ants. It is going to crush your home, your soul, your friends, everything. The volume of a wine bottle, 750 milliliters. Um, let's see, average water bottle here. This is about 591 mils, milliliters. So, all right, makes sense. 750 liters? Think about a two liter bottle. What kind of bottle of wine is this? The average, the area of an average size home. Now this one you might be more familiar with, that homes are typically measured in square footage. So 1,500 square feet, you know, pretty average. Square yards, that's humongous. Square miles, sweet Jesus, we're talking about the size of a city at this point. The area of Prairie State College's campus. What do you think? 123 square miles, 123 square yards, 123 acres. The acres are much more realistic than the square miles. Okay, 123 square miles is pretty darn huge. Okay. 123 square yards, that's not as big, right? That's really small for a campus, for an entire campus. The length of a city block, 200 centimeters. Okay, a centimeter is just like the width of your finger. It's not that. 200 kilometers, okay, remember we talked about a 5K was three miles? So yeah, 200 meters is the realistic one. The volume of your washing machine, 3.2 cubic yards, 3.2 cubic feet, or 3.2 cubic inches. Okay, the cubic inches, you got to rule out immediately, right? Right, because that's just way too small. 3.2 cubic yards? I mean, that's kind of big for, you know, a, a washing machine. So, yeah, the cubic feeder. And another thing, um, if you've bought a washing machine recently, then you know that they are measured in cubic feet. So that may be a giveaway. All right, just in case you need it again, here's the formula sheet. It has the area, the perimeter, the volume, the surface area all on here. Feel free to print this out um, and use it. So that finishes us up for section 13.5. I know this was a long section. Very sorry about that. This is a cute little depiction. I wanted to find something to show you how to find the volume of irregular shapes. Because um, we talked about the volume of like all these, you know, common shapes like prisms and pyramids and cylinders and spheres and stuff. But how do you find the volume of a dinosaur? Yeah. Well, you can find the volume by submerging it. So if you take, you know, some water and like I'm guessing this is like a test tube. That's why it has the little thing in there. Um, you could also just put it in like an aquarium or something like that, right? Where you measure the volume of water. You put the dinosaur in and you see how much it changes by. So the, the difference in the volumes must be um, on account of the dinosaur. So it's a fun little activity that you can do as well. Um, in a classroom, you could take, you know, 
one of these kind of things and you know measure out the volume before and after you know the dinosaurs there so okay like i said i know this was a lot in this section but hey it was the last section what left okay okay so that finishes up for math 206 i hope that this was somewhat enjoyable for you i always find this stuff very interesting and fun but you know that's me. I'm kind of a nerd that way. So, all right. Talk to you guys later.